Hello, this is a, um, a summary of our class notes on naive sorting all the way up to the bubble sort, which some might also consider naive. What we'll look at is an approach where we'll use variables only. And then we'll get a little smarter what we're doing. We'll add some loops. We'll add loops and arrays. And eventually, we'll encapsulate our work with functions. All right, let's start off. We're doing this idea called sorting. Someone gives me three variables, A, B, and C. I don't know what they are. Maybe it's 55. Maybe B is 5 and C is 34. If that's the case, I'm going to say my goal, my end result is A. I want to see the smallest number up front, the middle number, and the largest number last. You know, maybe I'd like to change A, B, and C to these values. Well, let's begin. That is, we'll get some input. We really don't know what these values are, but we're going to have to come up with a procedure that we always know that it's going to look like this. All right, so here we go. We're starting off with three integers, three variables, A, B, and C. I picked A, B, and C because why not? And I go to the keyboard, and I wait for someone to type in three integers. Here they are. Make believe it's 5, 34, and 55. If that's the case, I can see right away that A is the least, B is in the middle, and we have C. And this is their relationship. Great. How could I write this in C++? Well, in C++, I can say, well, A is less than or equal to B, and the logical AND. And at the same time, I'm going to check to see it's also true that B is less than or equal to C. If that's the case, I'm going to output whatever A is, whatever B is, followed by C. And notice I put a blank space in between them, so it looks nice. All right, so that's C++. But what if somebody gave me a number like this, 55, 5, and 34? Well, in that case, B is the smallest. C is in the middle, and A is the largest. How could I write that in C++? Same concept. Notice the less than or equal to sign is a binary operator. There's only a left-hand side and a right-hand side. If you go back a slide, I kind of cheat here and write it like this. I can't write this in C++. So that's why I have to use this logical AND operator. And then I ask, is um, C less than A? And then I write B, C, and A. So I have a general paradigm, a way of looking at things. Now, I really don't like typing this whole thing out. So what I'd like to do is put this, this whole concept in a function called display. And if b is the smallest one, I'll put that first. I'll put c the second one and a the uh, third one, meaning the greatest. So what would display look like? Well, display would look like, give me the first item right here. Give me my second number and give me my third number. And then I get a little fancy. I turned around and went to um, the ASCII code table. There are many websites to go from. This is the one that comes up first. And I found this number, 243. 243 is that symbol. So what I do is I ask the system not to print the number 243, but give me the character 243. So it'll give me one of these things. In this particular case, the less than or equal to sign. Now, I want to build these if statements. I have three variables. So if I start trying to use these um, inequality signs, the first time I run through it, I have a choice of three items for the first one. Once I use up one of these, there's only two left for the second one. So there are two here. Once I use up one of these, there's only one left for the last one. 
How many combinations is that? Well, typically, you have two combinations here times, excuse me, three combinations here times two combinations times one, which will give us six. So I go through all six of them. I say, well, A could be the smallest, and then B, second smallest, and then C. Well, I'm going to keep A the smallest, but I just did B, so I'm going to switch to C, and then B will be the largest. And I repeat this pattern, and I get all six of them. Notice it's a factorial relationship. Here is the code. Up here, you'll see our display function. Here, you'll see my first three. I group them like this so it looks nice. The order doesn't really matter. Only one of these will be executed after the user types in A, B, and C. All right, that would work. This is zooming in, zooming in on it. You'll see that this goes together. It's a binary operator. This is also a binary operator. And it says that the left hand, the uh, left hand side right here, left hand side, and the right hand side, both must be true. If both of these are true, true and true, then I will display B, C, A. Notice I have every combination here. That was a lot of typing. No, not really, but it was. Here I test all the combinations out. Next, does this technique scale? This looked great for three variables. What happens when I have four? In four variables, I use the math that I think is correct. And I say, well, four variables is four for the first one, three for the second, two, and then one. 24 if statements must be written, must be written. If I have five variables, it grows to 120. I can only say, ouch. What if I had 100 variables? Where would I have 100 variables? What if I had students in a university? You notice more than 100. But let's say I only had 100, and I said, let's put them in numerical order or alphabetical order. So that's 100 factorial. That's roughly 9.3 times 10 to the 157 power. I didn't do the work. I actually used a calculator. No comment on how many if statements. But how long would it take if I could type in one if statement a second, non Stop. Well, this is how many seconds are in a year. So I divide the number of seconds into there, and I get roughly 3 times 10 to 150 years. It doesn't scale very well, even for 100 students. Whoops. Wrong. That's, that's an extra slide, sorry. All right, let's suppose I had four variables, A, B, and C. I don't know what they are, but I made up some numbers here. And I use a different method. I say if A is bigger than B, then they're wrong. Let's swap them. So I swap A and B. If, then I move down and look at B and C right after I did the first step. And then I can maybe swap B and C, and maybe swap C. So you notice I'm going in steps of two like this. Maybe I'll look at these two. If they're out of order, I'll put them in order. I'll look at the next two. If they're out of order, I will put them in order. And I'll look at the last two. If they're out of order, I'll put them in order. If I'd like to ask what's happening. Well, I use this word swap. Swap is already built into C++. You don't have to write it. You just have to use the word swap and it will automatically give you the following. What is the following? It says, whatever number you give me here, the first number, and whatever second number you give me, it will take the first number, put it into a temporary variable, take the second number, put it in x, then take the temporary variable and put it in y. And when I leave here, x and y will be switched. 
it's done. Great. So here I'm going to ask somebody for four variables, A, B, C, and D. And then I'm going to use my rules. And then I'm going to display. I'm going to call this pass 1. And I'm going to display A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. This means first digit, second digit, third, fourth. First, second, third, fourth. And when I type in these numbers, it displays this for me. And I notice something. The 44 got swapped and moved up. The 60, or the 10, got swapped and moved up. So notice the smaller numbers moved up. Or you could think of the higher numbers moved down. 55 moved down. 60 moved down. Wow, so it moved everything down 1. If it moved everything down 1, why don't I do it again and move everything down one another time? So I use the same number because I want to see what's happening. And I notice, all right, the 60 is at the bottom here. 10, after the second move, 10 is all the way up here. Interesting. So things are moving back and things are moving forward. Let's swap this again. So notice, it's the same exact code. I've changed nothing. So now, we had 10 was way over here. 10 moved up into one position. 10 was swapped again. And 10 was swapped this way. And notice 60 ended up in the rears here. 55 ended up in its final resting position very quickly. So I want to think about what has happened here. Is this something I could take advantage of? And if I look at it carefully, I will see things are happening. Look at that 10 swapping its way over. And 60 started off here. And very quickly it ended up in the rears. It very quickly ended up in its final position. That's why I show you all this red here. So I'm asking myself, do I really need this line right here? And do I need this one? Because I realize 60 is in its final position. With them out, I, everything works. And I turn around and I said, what? 55 is in its final position. Do I need this one? So I'm taking out some more and I'm running the program. Here it is, removed. I run the thing, and I use some different numbers, because, you know, maybe my numbers are rigged. And I find the 90, very quickly, just like the 60, ends up in its final space, very quickly. And 2 is slowly moving over to the top. And 4 is moving into it, move 44, excuse me, into its final place. So I noticed this thing. I noticed something here. We'll see it again in a moment. I needed three if statements. I needed two if statements. And I needed one if statement. So I'll ask myself now, does this thing scale? So now I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, B, C, D, E. That's five variables. With five variables, I had to write four of them here, three here, two and one all together you can see it's four plus three plus two plus one looks like the sum of some integers four plus three plus two plus one all right here it is running here i have one two three four one two three two and one and I'm running it, I ran it with a bunch of numbers to make sure that I'm, my, not, my mind's not playing tricks on me. I compare the two. Here's 3, 2, 1, 4, 3, 2, 1. Everything worked. So I asked myself, what is this showing me? Well, there's a pattern. 6, here's 10, 
Have I seen any equation, any rule in any of my math classes that would allow me a shortcut to add this up if somebody said you had n variables? And yes, we have this equation here, which is simply n squared. I mean, technically, you're right. It's n squared times n minus 1, the whole thing divided by 2. But when you have n squared minus n, that's so small. This is predominant. This is the dominant factor. So usually people just say, you know, the order is n squared. So the first program we looked at, we had to write n factorial if statements. You gave me um, three variables. It was 3 times 2 times 1. And we had to write six if statements. If you gave me here 3, you would have to write 2 plus 1. You'd have to have three if statements. When these numbers get larger than 1, 2, and 3, the savings here is substantial. Here we have, when 100 in students, we were talking about 150 years of work. Here, if we had 100 students, we'd have 100 squared. Right? It's 100 times 100, which is four zeros. And that's clearly not 150 years of work, but it's a lot of work. Maybe there's somehow we some way we could use the for loop to do this heavy lifting of repetition. And we can. I grab my four if statements that I need for five variables. And I say instead of saying four, three, two, one, I'm just gonna use the brute computing power and just repeat these four every time. And I'm gonna repeat it enough times so that when I'm done. All the numbers are guaranteed to be in order. That's great. So now, how many if statements do I have to write for this thing? Well, if here I see five variables, one, two, three, four, five, I needed four if statements. If I had six variables, I would need five if statements. If I had 100 students, I would need to write 99 if statements and put them in this loop to repeat them. Okay, repeat them 100 times. Here it is for 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There it is, 6, 6. I repeat this 5 times. And I pass over 5 times. So notice I repeated it six times, passed five times. That's where you get this idea of n squared. Five times five is 25. So for n variables, we need n minus one if statements. This is pretty linear, the work I have to do writing. So here's a comparison of the amount of work I have to do. The first one n factorial, second one, n squared writing, next one, n. Now I'm just talking about the programmer right now, sitting down working, typing up code to control this machine. Next method, we bring in the power of the array. You and I say something very simple like d3. We automatically and instantly get these three variables. I don't know what's in them. Don't know, don't know, don't know. But now I have three variables. And you might say, Professor, what's the big deal? A, B, C. The big deal actually is in this number. It doesn't have to be a constant. I can use an index, an integer variable in there. Usually we just call it I. Its formal name is index or indices. When I use variables such as this, I am forced to type A, B, C, D, E. And if I have more, dot, dot, dot. 
But if I have this incredible thing called an array, I can take advantage of the index starting at 0 and going all the way up to n minus 1. Notice it's a less than symbol here, so you never get to n. The biggest n index will be is n minus 1. It'll start definitely at 0 and move one at a time. So now, instead of me typing up even n minus 1 if statements, let's use a typo in here, um, this thing here, this is sort of like a greater than b. It says I no longer have to do that stuff, a greater than b. I can use that index because it says look at variable d of i and go to the one underneath it. One move over, just one. Take a look at those two. And if they're out of order, swap them. But notice one important thing here. I changed from n to n minus 1. That's because if you ever go up to n, if this thing here is n minus 1, this will be n minus 1 plus 1, which is n. The array doesn't go that far. It's so beautiful. Even when we get our input data, we don't have to type a, b, and c anymore. This could be 5,000. I don't have to type 5,000 variables. I do this. It'll start from 0 and go all the way up to 4,999 if this is 5,000. My workload has dropped. So here's my program now. I can ask for any number of variables. There they are. I go from the first one to the last one. I then create all my if statements here, test everything one at a time. I repeat it the necessary number of times. And then when I'm done, I show people the answer. And it doesn't matter how many variables I have. I just change that. If I have 100 students, I change the 5 to 100, and this works. No extra typing or coding on my part. What I'd like to do next is to clean up my code by encapsulating it, putting things in boxes. Here's my bubble sort. There's the exact code. I didn't change it. I did a cut, pasted it in. And what I did is says someone's going to give me an array, D. I don't know how big it is, so I'm going to put the size right here, n. So this n goes there, and this d is the same d I'm using right here, and here as well. And this is in a safe little contained box, just like your computer, your cell phone. No one's allowed in there. You just have controls, ways to input things to it, press buttons, etc. Display. The same thing. I want to look at my data, but I don't want to keep seeing all that code. I take these lines of code and I put them in a box and I give the box a cool name, display. Give me the data, how much data, and this thing will know how much data there is, and um, display it. Same with my input. Starting at zero, going all the way up to the end. How many? There it is. Notice there's a pattern here that's important to see when you create these functions, that there's a repetition, there is a paradigm, there is something to follow. Patterns are important. Now, because I encapsulated everything, my main program becomes this beautiful small piece of code that says, here are my, I called it variables instead of D. And how many variables are there? Five. What do I want to do? Get the variables inputted. And here I put a comment, load them. Now I want to display the variables. How many? All of them. Show them, unsorted. Then I use my bubble sort algorithm, comment, and then I display. Notice I reuse display to show the unsorted data and to show it sorted. There's the out sample run of the program. And of course, now the conclusion, the big picture. How you look at a problem affects its answer. The language 
and language is important to the complexity of your solution. Without the for loop, which is part of our language of repetition, how many times would you like to repeat that? And without arrays, item 1, item 2, item 3, item 4, things were exponentially or exploding with this uh, x squared or x factorial. I hope this was informative and uh, made up for, um, you know, supplemented your class. Thank you.